Um, I'd like to open perhaps by saying that uh, 1917 has been mentioned a little bit this weekend. Um, Peter mentioned the railway uh, across the Nullarbor and I think Lou mentioned uh, the First World War which was at its zenith I suppose in 1917. But a lot of other things happened in 1917. Uh, <clears throat> one of them was the Balfour Declaration uh, which brought into being the state of Israel. Another of course was the Russian Revolution that brought into being the Soviet Union. And yet another, which is anniversary is of centenary as I understand today, were events in Fatima in Portugal that galvanised the Catholic world to oppose communism. And another and perhaps history will give it a greater magnitude than it's currently getting, is that was the year in which Douglas <coughs> began the social credit movement. And he began it in a most unusual way. It, it was born out of his inspecting a set of books, which are pretty extraordinary. I've never heard of a movement that's been created like that. Now, we seem at the moment to be being assailed by every manner and form of attack. We've got attacks about gender confusion, we've got attacks on marriage, we've got attacks on our freedom uh, to resist immunisation. And as Gandalf said, no matter what comes through that door, no matter what comes through that door, you stand and fight. But the thing beyond that, which I think we have, we've, it's time to look at, is that we'll never win this battle by resisting evil. While we'll lose it if we don't resist evil, the winning of it will come with the truth. Because it's only the truth that sets us free. Now, we don't know what the finance economic truth is in this country. No politician knows what is happening in the national economy and nor does any economist and that's provable it's provable because if you said to any director of a public company like bhp do you know what's going on with your company he'd say yes i think i know a little and he does the reason he knows that is they do a set of books that is the measure they measure the thing so they know what is there. And they measure it by doing balance sheets and they measure it by doing profit and loss accounts. But no government on this earth does either. All they do in the way of public accountancy is give us a guesstimate of what may happen next year. That's a budget. Every budget is that. It's a guess about what might happen later on. The other thing they do is give us a uh, estimate of gross domestic product. And all that does is measure what happened last year, the total activity last year. It's only a measure of activity and it's only a measure of past activity. But what that meant in terms of benefits to us is ignored. It's not measured. That is measured in a profit and loss account. And <clears throat> our credit worthiness, our wealth, if you like, is measured with the balance sheet. Now, <clears throat> I don't think there is any chance of getting proper public understanding of the situation with credit and economics. It's not possible unless we do a set of books. Now, governments will resist that. Um, the swamp resists it. But that doesn't really matter because 
we can independently, even of government, do those things. And that there is the best balance sheet that's ever been produced for the nation of Australia. And it tells us things that no politician has ever thought about, ever contemplated. Um, the most significant thing it says probably is that the liabilities this nation have, the greatest liability we, we have, is money. Because money is a claim upon our goods and services. Money is not an asset. But governments, they rush to sell our assets to the land, the Chinese, or whatever it is. They, get, they sell it, want to exchange our assets in order to acquire a liability. Now it's true when they sell an asset they get a they get another asset which is foreign exchange. So they trade an asset for an asset. But they have to pay the fellow that owned the farm, so they have to create a liability against all of our other assets. So in net terms, we are poorer by the amount that we export and by the amount of assets we sell to others. And a balance sheet will show that. Nothing else will show that. Now the other account that needs to, has to be done is a supply and demand account it's been called. It's published in Oliver's book, Lives of Our Own. It's got a lot of explanatory notes, but it's an account that lists uh, two and a half pages of figures, and they are not things plucked out of the air. Most of them come from the, this is for the United States of America, the balance sheets for Australia, they're samples, they're samples. It was done for the United States of America because that's where probably the most complete statistics are available. As far as I'm concerned, is this document which proves the validity of the A plus B theorem. You can have a theorem called the second law of thermodynamics or the theory of relativity, but if reality on the nature of things doesn't confirm, if the universe doesn't conform to that, it's, it can't be considered as being valid. Now Douglas hypothesised that there was a shortage of purchasing power, continuous being continuously being generated in the economy at all times. We've measured that. And at the beginning of measuring it, we looked at the gross product. The gross domestic product of last year was in the United States, or was then the last year, this is for, 90, for 2014 actually, uh, was the GDP in that year was $17 trillion. We went through every item of income for every person, proper person in the United States. And that comes to $10 trillion. And we went through, and we took their figure for the consumer products that are produced and on the market and actually were sold and that came to twelve and a half trillion dollars. Obviously they couldn't buy two and a half trillion dollars of them other than by going in further into debt or by disposing of assets to those who could go into debt. Now once you've got something like that it's very obvious and you couldn't argue with it. That was part of a national accounts even if it's not done by government, it's done by a number of accountants that can get their head around it and have some authority. Uh, it's, uh, it then becomes unarguable. How, how do you answer why that is and how do we discuss what we do about it? You see, it's a bit like when the armies of Tolkien were... In, engaged in warfare at the gates of Mordor, they were resisting evil. But the real battle 
was getting the ring into the crack of doom. And the thing that'll set us free is the truth. If we can establish the truth that there is a gross deficiency of purchasing power in the economy being generated all the time, and I'll tell you, the United States is very profitable. They paid $10 trillion to their proper persons to induce them to produce $12.5 trillion of consumer goods and services. So therefore, if that was a public company, they're in profit by $2.5 billion. There's also all the capital that's been contributed as well, but we'll leave that for the moment. Um, so we've, we're very profitable. But how do we get access to that profit? Well, at the moment, we have to, go and, we have to borrow to get access to our own profit. And it's, it's damned obvious when the, when the figures are there and unarguable. There was a first item in that account. We've got wages and salaries earned by every individual in the United States aggregated together. And the other benefits they get from um, their employers as well. And that comes to a total of 43% of the GDP. All of the wages and salaries, which is the main method of paying people, comes to 43% of the gross product. It used to be above 50% in the 90s. It's now down to 43. We all know that in, with employment going the way it is, capital in the form of technology is taking over from manual, even mental work, so that's going to continue, it's going down, and it's going to continue to go down, inexorably, barring natural catastrophe. We've been through the other, all the rest of the data, like dividends and uh, income of uh, proprietor, private proprietors, and th this data was not put together for our benefit. It was not really tailored to measure what we want to tailor. As an example of that, they talk about dividends and the, the total private dividends, and they give you a figure. But when you look at it, we went to the Standard & Poor 500, which is a big, the 500 biggest companies in the US, basically. And I found, and this wasn't the government, it's a private research uh, institute that looks at dividends and wants to know all, all things about them and asks the question how much of these dividends are actually paid to proper persons or partnerships of proper persons and the answer is two and a half percent so a lot of these figures have to be rethought and this particular account has chosen to say that 50 percent goes to proper persons. And still there's two and a half trillion dollar shortfall. So the shortfall is much higher than we suppose. And what I'm saying is we've got to stand in front of the door and no matter what comes through it, stand our ground and fight the thing. But we've also got to try to put together a small institute a body of people with some standing, uh, some sort of people with enough acumen to establish those accounts. It do, I'm not suggesting that social credit does this, or that the Liberal Party does it, or that any other entity should be seen to do it. Um, it's not a matter of claiming credit for this. If we can establish those accounts credibly, and they're pretty hard to argue with, you have to argue specifics. You can't argue generalities. You've got to say that figure is wrong, and it's wrong in this way and for this reason. And you can say, well, and, and obviously the counter argument can be put. 
if we can establish that, and the evidence is there, I think, in time, it won't happen tomorrow, but in time, the sheer bloody logic of that, the unarguable fact of the deficiency of purchasing power is going to become so evident and so obvious that the economists and the politicians may inexorably um, catch up. I've just done a pricey of my longer theory and I think it's perhaps an introductory way to start. If you want the full um, the full treatment, we'll start reading that profit and loss account from the beginning. And I might actually, just to give you an idea of where we started from, or where the account starts from, rather. It's, um, the thing's been called a conceptualisation, a national supply and demand account, for the United States of America, and it's in the form of also of a profit and loss account. The principles adopted in the preparation of this account, one, the purpose of production is consumption. Two, the true or real cost of production is consumption. That is, the cost involved in consuming the raw materials, labour, machinery, etc., necessary to bring any specific item of production into being. Three, the purpose of a national economy is, to, is the objective good of its people. That is, to deliver the goods and services that they need to survive and flourish, while calling upon the least amount of labour and resource consumption. This excludes employment, corporate profits, or economic growth per se, as social objectives in and, in and of themselves. <coughs> Four, calculations of gross domestic production are measures of human activity, not of results or outcomes from this activity considered in terms of human satisfaction. Five. The national supply and demand accounts, the commercial equivalents of which are profit and loss accounts, though nowhere in existence, are the best measure of a nation's economic performance because they are constructed from the perspective of, of assessing, assessing the economic satisfaction of its national proper persons. Six, this count account has been constructed with a view to ascertaining aggregate personal income available to enable personal access to the gross consumer production available. While all GDP, and I give the figure of 17.3 trillion, is ultimately paid for by consumers, either in prices or taxes, Capital goods production has been dis disregarded in this account as its inclusion in consumer prices in the form of CAPEX or OPEX charges will not take place until a later period of time. 8. GDP treats exports as increased production activity, while this account treats exports as a, as a decrease in production availability. 9. It, it was resolved as a principle to proceed in spite of analytical difficulty. National accounts as currently available, while no doubt approximately accurate for their intended purpose, are careless in differentiating out proper person's receipts, for example, from private receipts. As a result, the GDP component private interest income is given as 1.3 trillion while personal interest payments are two point uh, 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 were a quarter of a trillion the and mortgage interest payments are 387 billion for a total of 
640 billion. This implies a clearly inaccurate situation where proper persons have loaned out over twice as much, this, twice the sum of their debts, assuming equality in interest rates. Thankfully, this con uh, conundrum was resolved by accessing, and we give the the link to the data, which enabled imputed interest, which is now included in current interest income, to be deducted. Imputed interest is not purchasing power available to consumers until a later period of time. Just to comment on that, some of the interest that people have been receiving is they're seeming to say in their super fund. That's not purchasing power perhaps for 40 years. But it's added in now to make it look as though, you know, we've got some, some income. <coughs> Notwithstanding the dearth of clear data specific to proper persons and the difficulty in differentiating them from private uh, corporate receipts in many instances, this account was persisted with, not because of its likelihood in achieving complete accuracy, but because in the absence of the desired information and in the hope of advancing the realisation that the true measure of an economy's performance in terms of hum human satisfaction is calculable and probably only calculable along the approximate lines used here. This account can at last provide a template which, with due references uh, due refinements and corrections, and perhaps one day with government generated data specifically geared to its purpose, we will yield an account which will be able to provide us with more accurate information. Any and all assistance towards this end would be most welcome. And one of the things we would hope to have generated from this is some criticism, because we can't criticise this account without suggesting a more accurate figure. And if they can give us that, well, that's very good. And the final point, once the various nations are committed to a full set of accounts aimed at understanding their economies from the, from the, the point of view of their proper person nationals, the estimated unused but available potential capacity to produce desirable goods and services when, where and as required could be an additional sub, uh, subsidiary part of this account or be presented as part of the national balance sheet and form part of the basis upon which the need for additional purchasing power, if any, would be calculated. In other words, gross, commun gross consumer production uh, would identify actual consumer production in the period, but it either may also include in some subsection or be associated with an additional account for the purpose of quantifying the unused capacity to deliver desirable consumer production. So that's the basis on which the account was pursued. And uh, it's all related to the, prop the true interests of proper persons. And what is the purpose of the economy? Uh, the purpose of production is consumption. Um, the purpose of the economy is um, to be measured in human satisfaction. And, and even, really, in moral and spiritual terms, because we can ascend up the ladder from total commitment to uh, enslavement to materialism, uh, towards leisure, towards uh, having more time with our families, uh, towards serving each other on a voluntary manner and therefore probably in a better way because we're not, we'll be actually interested in what we're doing and not compelled by trying to get a dollar out of the system. And also, it may give us a little time to contemplate nature um, and all of creation and to try to form 
a little better relationship with God himself. So this is a theological document. Uh, Chas, the, the, the figures you've uh, used there clearly demonstrate this deficiency in purchasing power. Now, we were talking just a day or two ago about that very matter of how it might be dealt with, and we're hearing around the world a bit of a push for what's called the basic income group. I'm sure people here have read about it. Um, would you just like to have a couple of comments on, on uh, how satisfactory that might deal with the problem or, or what alternative there may be? Thank you. Well, Ken, we're aware that there's a, something of a push for it. Um, the author of Lives of Our Own was invited to speak at their seminar, the Basic Income Seminar in New York, mm -hmm. which Oliver did, and uh, he was informed later that he'd won the prize for the best uh, presentation or lecture in the Basic Income Movement, uh, but he still hasn't got his prize, so <laughs> I think there might be a little war in in the camp there somewhere. Um, as Oliver pointed out, as the proposal is now, the payment of this basic income is either going to come from taxation or increased debt. Yeah. And I can't see much problem for what I call the Golden International in, in a continuing situation where basically everything's funded by debt to themselves. I've used that term Golden International because it, it's imputed to have been used by uh, Pope John Paul II and his mentor Cardinal Wazinski in describing the three competing forces for the future of the human organism. One was the Red International and it's run into a few headwinds and the Soviet falling over. The other was the Golden International Isle, which was described, I think, fairly accurately. accurately. It encompasses all of those people that are involved in the administration, direction or control of issuing credit. And there are persons of every nationality and background on the whole of the earth involved in that national Isle. Certainly there are Chinese bankers, there are Japanese ones, there are Indian ones and Brazilian ones and all the rest of them. The other so-called uh, contender for the future of the human race is, of course, the Christian faith, yeah. which he called the Black International after the colour of the, our, our priest smocks. Um, I think we may see some readiness to accept a basic income for everybody. It'll be a sort of a hyped up form of social security. We'll be totally dependent upon government for it. And moreover, government will be totally dependent on the Golden International to get the wherewithal. So, I'm not that enthusiastic about the basic income. We're talking about, uh, as, as this book says, a type of situation where we're converting the whole of the nation into a type of cooperative where we're all empowered as beneficial owners and we share in the, di in the dividend when we have one. Often you hear people in conversation say when that we're talking about the uh, poverty in the world and the things that are happening, they'll say, well, we're greedy. I've got a very good answer to that. I understand the question because I'm a peasant. <laughs> and when I was in my teens, my brother and I started a piggery. And uh, we'd been used to 
hole in the lantern while our dad fed the pigs after dark and that sort of thing. And all we ever observed was the most horrendous greed, inconceivable, <laughs> with a number of pigs that would grow to the point that pigs couldn't fit in the trough and they'd be popping off the end and charging back in and tipping over. And it was just bedlam. And so a fella came along one day and said, uh, perhaps you should consider giving your pigs a self-feeder. <laughs> this was like anarchy in World War Three being suggested as a serious answer. But anyhow, being mad beyond our years, we tried it. We made sure we fed them as well as we could before we put them in there, and we discovered something remarkable. Those pigs were perfect gentlemen. They could go to get their meal whenever they wanted it. They didn't have to argue with everybody else to get it because there was plenty of time. It was always there. And so that's the way I discovered that it's scarcity that creates greed. It's insecurity. It's not how much you've got that keeps or makes you happy. It's how securely you hold it. And if somebody's threatened to take it off you through taxation or, or a boom and bust economy, you get a situation where all people know that they want. What do you really want? What do you really want? And the only answer they can think of is more. They want more. And because they're insecure in what they have. So that's my answer on the greed thing. Put people in a position of absolute security where they're going to get their national dividend and the prices are going to be stabilised with their, the discount that Douglas suggested. And we can get past all that and we can start to rediscover each other. And uh, the true nature of, ben of a benevolent world. And... Uh, a benevolent deity. <laughs>